My name is Don Jensen. Um, I was on the USS Pennsylvania at the time of Pearl Harbor. On that Sunday morning, it was a nice 80 degree weather and all this beautiful weather. I had gone out to the deck, took the Sunday paper, and I sat there and in a minute uh, a plane went by. It didn't even ring a bell. When the second one went by, I saw the the red meatball on the side of the airplane and realized that it wasn't a drill. This was something greater than that. And then when the third one came by, we knew that there was a problem. And it was just a mass confusion from that time on. We got strafed by the planes that were coming in. Uh, everybody was rushing around in the area trying to find something to do. A sailor come up to me and we had a 50 caliber machine gun and uh, he helped me set it up, had me some ammunition and so I fired at the airplanes as they were coming in. You had a, a pretty good shot at them but you never knew whether you hit them or not but they were so low that uh, it's possible that we hit them. That first 53 minutes that the fighter planes were there and the torpedo planes were there, it was just a mass of not having any idea where they were coming from or anything else. But they were so low that most of them, you could see the gunner, the pilot from the torpedo planes and, and the fighters. Uh, you could see the pilots. They were that low. You were in such cramped quarters that you had to be careful where you fired the gun. Because if you swung it too far around, uh, you would hit one of our own ships or a building. You could see the explosions. Nothing ever got quiet because the bombs would explode and, and then the ammunition from the ships would explode. Ships were rolling over. You could see the water that was on fire from the oil that was on the, on the water. You could see the pickup boats that were bringing people out of the water that were actually burning and hauling them over towards the hospital. I think about those sailors and marines that were in the busting water and the explosions of the Arizona. And I think the worst thing that I can think about was two days afterwards when I was with Admiral Kimmel on an inspection tour. We went over to Arizona and you could hear the rapping on the, on the wall from people inside the, the hull of the ship, and we couldn't do a thing about it. Many of them are still in that ship on the bottom. Uh, approximately a month before the war, uh, I was sent over to Bataan along with uh, about uh, 20 other uh, soldiers to train Philippine constabulary soldiers. These were actually draftees that were pulled off the street because there was such a shortage of soldiers on the front line. Unfortunately, most of the ammunition that we had was all World War I. And we had a tremendous amount of problem with this ammunition because at least one out of four bullets is a dud and at least one out of every three hand grenades was a dud. So you, for every hand grenade you threw, you had to throw at least three more to make sure that you had uh, an effect on the enemy. And this was pretty dangerous because you don't have much time to duck when you throw a hand grenade. I was on Bataan for approximately three weeks when uh, General King ordered the surrender of Bataan. Uh, I, uh, along with uh, my battalion that I was attached to, uh, was surrounded by the uh, Japanese soldiers. They took all our arms, naturally, and then uh, pushed us back out on the road near Marvelis. I was on the death march for uh, two days and three nights. And during that period of time, I saw hundreds of Filipinos and Americans shot, bayoneted, 
the heads cut off with swords by the officers for the slightest infraction. Um, I knew I couldn't take this kind of, I wasn't going to last long myself. So uh, during a rainstorm, there was a lot of lightning and thunder, a lot of noise. I ha dove off the side of the road and into the jungle and worked my way into the deeply as I could into the jungle and get away to get away from the column. It took me approximately uh, four days to work my way back to Maravellis and I gathered up some wood and debris that was there, tied it together with anything I could find and worked myself out into the bay and swam back to Corregidor. I would say that it took me a good 10 hours that I was in the water, uh, not knowing at the time, but found out later that uh, it was shark infested. Uh, but uh, evidently I wasn't good, good enough to eat. And they weren't interested in me, thank goodness. A washing machine Charlie was our mysterious visitor who used to come around at night. And you could hear him, and he had a very distinctive sound, and it sounded like a washing machine. And they would come around at night, and they would go around and around and around, you know, endlessly. And then they would finally drop a bomb. It was like uh, any, meeny, miny, mo, and then psh, drop the bomb over here. Well, one of them could have got me. Two days after we left uh, the beachhead area in Guadalcanal, where we first landed, we went to the front lines. One of these Japanese bombers dropped a bomb that hit right in where our company area had been and did a lot of damage. So fortunately, we were not there. Once in a while, they dropped a bomb and, and hurt or even killed somebody. But we would laugh because they would usually miss everything. The idea was to harass us and to keep us awake and to keep us nervous. And it was a more of a nuisance sort of thing. Our searchlights would uh, try to pick them up. Sometimes they did. And uh, we would shoot our anti-aircraft uh, shells at them. Uh, once in a while, we'd hit one. But they would drop their bombs, and then they'd leave. We would watch it. It became our nightly television show. If he hadn't come around that night, it was like, gee, we didn't get to see uh, our favorite show tonight. It was the only entertainment we had. And we would actually had like a cheering section. Guys would yell and cheer, go for it, Charlie, and, and uh, hey, there he is, get him, get him. And one night, washing machine Charlie came, and the poor guy was going around and around and around, and all of a sudden we saw this big ball of fire. I mean, it just went, whoom, and we knew he'd gotten hit, and he just exploded up there. Well, what we didn't know was that they had brought in some Black Widow night fighters, and they'd just been waiting for this guy to come around. <laughs> well, once or twice with the Black Widow night fighters, and poor old washing machine Charlie never came back. <laughs> it was, we kind of missed them too. I suppose the most memorable was when I marched down and um, we thought that some planes that came over were our, our bombers, but they weren't, they were Jap bombers. And so we had to run like anything. And as we ran, uh, down came some parachutes with food and, and a copy of the Tokyo Times talking about a great win the Japs had had, which they never did. We heard this sound, which obviously was a bombardment of some kind, and, uh, but we couldn't see. And uh, so uh, Solomon Arnold came up to me and said, Master, me sorry too much, Japan fleety come. I said, don't talk rubbish. I turned the radio on by then. I could hear all these American voices. So we had to wait until about nine o'clock, and then we saw 85 ships, I think they were, and uh, all the little landing craft 
going backwards and forwards from the ships carrying soldiers ashore, marines. I got a, a note which was passed up by, by one of my, my Solomon Island policemen and um, telling me to come down and which way to come so that I could avoid the Japanese. And so um, I packed up everything and um, took my radio equipment down to Aula, which was the government station, and left it there. And then I went in and, and reported to the Americans. This Marine came up and shook me by the hand. I couldn't speak. I was too overcome. Well, that was the happiest day of my life. We arrived in Singapore, monsoon weather, pouring with rain, and I was there for several days. I was in the camp most of the time with the cookhouse, as I was sort of in with the charge of the water and with, with, with my other friend of mine that got killed, that died afterwards. But um, um, I also drove one or two of the officers up to the front line during the time with different messages and that and um, always had instructions that should they anybody get killed the other one should get them get the try and get to where we were going and it was a called wimpo when we were coming back we had a message to say that the uh, roads were cut off we had to go a different way with that i managed to get back the camp and then for quite a long time we were could hear the bombing and you know shells and what have you but um, then after a few well it wasn't long really before we had the message we had to go back so we started going back to Singapore and um, from day to day we went farther into Singapore after we got over the bridge we thought we might be all right but we could hear the Japanese. We could even when the we could hear the shells coming over at us, and uh, we could hear all their messages and that. I could hear them quite plain, so we I knew they weren't far away. And then the next thing I knew was after a few days that we were going to surrender, and there'd be no more fighting. We were. So I told we weren't allowed to talk too much, you know, we weren't allowed to say anything, you know. We even had um, any air belongings. They told us we had to get rid of all our belongings. We had to put our rifles in and put them in the, um, one, of the one of the rooms there. And that's all I knew. And the next day we had a march to Changi. The day after we surrendered, they come marching through, right through Singapore. And that's when I saw all the Japanese with their um, ammunition and all that, you know. But when we got to Changi, um, we were put in camps there, and we had all we had to eat then was rice, and that was full of maggots and God knows what. Terrible stuff it was. I think it was what they'd be... And ca uh, cattle feed, we called it. This is a Browning automatic rifle. This was my favorite weapon. One like this was issued to me right out of boot camp. I carried this weapon basically through four campaigns. It's a full automatic weapon, uh, 450 rounds per minute rate of fire. However, it did have a selector on it so that you could fire a single shot if you wanted to. Each one of these clips held uh, 20 rounds. The ammunition belt loaded actually weighs more than the VAR does. It fired from an open bolt position. It had bipods on the front and had a butt rest here in the back and a shoulder rest here. However, as soon as we got on Guadalcanal, we realized that since this weapon had been designed during World War I as a trench warfare weapon, 
we didn't need these bipods on front, and so these were discarded. This weapon weighs 21 pounds, 7 ounces unloaded. Now it seems like it weighs twice that much. I don't know how I ever carried this thing through those four campaigns through the jungle and so forth, but it's very heavy to try to fire from the shoulder. We just normally fire it from the hip position like this. I think the Japanese feared this weapon more than anything else, even more so than our machine guns. Why? Because our machine guns were stationary. They could usually figure out about where the machine guns would be. They would be in a prominent location up, up front or maybe in the rear behind sandbags and they were easy to spot. But a BA Armin could be anywhere where the riflemen were. The Japanese tried to draw the fire from the Browning automatic riflemen first so they could find out where they were and we had to use discipline. Normally we did not answer their first attacks we let the riflemen take care of it. We held our fire with these weapons until they came charging at us, or unless we were approaching an area, we knew there were some Japanese hiding in some bushes or camouflage, then we could take this weapon and spray the area. The Marine Corps decided that since this weapon was so effective, they gave every fourth man one of these weapons. It increased our firepower tremendously. I got into a few firefights with this, and I'm awful glad I had it. But one time I had to fight my way out of an ambush, uh, whereby uh, myself and another BA Armin was ad advancing across an open area when we were ambushed by a Japanese officer and four men nearby. They could see us, but we could not see them. And when they opened fire, they kill the man next to me and I had to shoot my way out of the ambush. I might not have survived if I hadn't had this. When we got on the train at Singapore we went right through into Thailand, right through Malaya, boiling hot sun it was, we were sweating. So many of us were sent right up to the top of the jungle. It took us several days to get up there and we got to Camp Rambiori where the uh, bridge is. I was there for several months. It was right in the monsoon weather. And we were absolute filth it was there. I swear we lost a lot of boys, died with cattle, a dysentery and cholera. They were dying like flies there. Well, most camps were the same really. There was not much difference in them. You just had your bag of rice each day. You had a bit of rice in the morning, a bit of rice at night, and that was it. But um, I never seemed to get worried at all. I don't know why, I'm sure, but uh, that's the way I am, I suppose. I don't know. This camp itself was terrible. We were underwater most of the time, almost sleeping in water. But we had to get up next morning and go off to do through the jungle to meet the bits of bridge we were working on. Each morning we had to walk right through for about three miles through to the to get by the river, by the camp where we had to build these different bridges, small bridges to get different places. And we were there for a long time. You had to do as you were told, else you'd soon get a belt, and I'll tell you that. You, if you didn't do it quick, when they told you to do it, you had to do it quick. And that's where a lot of fellas slipped up, you know. They'd get a beating for nothing. You never knew each day what you were going to do. Most of it was doing all the digging, perhaps all day long, same old job, all the day. If, if we had, we had one day off in ten, I think. In that particular day, we'd have to go out and pick up any wood there was in the jungle to pull in for the camp. It was a terrible place to go to, but after we left there, we went to another camp farther up, and um, we were up in the woods cutting down big trees. There was two, three elephants working with us in the jungle, pulling, pushing these trees down, this particular bridge was for the troops to get through to Burma and that was a roughish place there. 
there was three or four men escaped there, here soldiers, and then within four days they were found, and they took them out next day in a truck, and the guards got in with their rifles and they went and we didn't see no more of them. So they were shot somewhere out in the jungle. The Black Cat Squadron was job was to go out at night and destroy enemy shipping that was resupplying the Japanese that were still in the area and to keep the submarines from surfacing to recharge their batteries during the night. The plane was originally designed just for reconnaissance. So then they put bomb racks under the wings to carry the bombs and the torpedoes. We could carry 2,000 pound payload, 500 pound bombs, or two torpedoes, 1,000 pounds each, or four depth charges, which were 500 pounds each. We had a 50 caliber gun on each side and a clamshell blister that could be opened up so the gun could be fired, and uh, 230 calibers in the nose. A typical Black Cat mission would be we would take off at sunset, a radar would pick up a submarine. Most of the time the submarines would submerge before we could get to them, and at that point we didn't have any way to tell which way they went. There was five squadrons of us out there. We had 15 planes in each squadron, and we would take turns uh, with different missions. During the day, their ships would be camouflaged. They would put vegetation and stuff on them so you couldn't see them. And the Air Force had trouble finding them. At night, once they got underway, they were very visible because of the luminous wake that the uh, moving ship creates due to the phosphorescent stuff in the sea, especially on a moonlit night. Our, our main protection was that we flew at night where they w couldn't see us. They couldn't hear us coming, and after we left the scene, they couldn't see us leaving. Our method of attack was to sneak up on them. The idea was to see a ship drop down to sea level 50 feet and make a run on the ship, let our bombs go so it would sink or disable it. and keep going so they couldn't shoot us down. Because of our slow speed uh, and uh, low altitude, we would come up over the horizon before they were aware of us. We were always trying not to be spotted to avoid any contact with fighters because we were so vulnerable. A fighter could shoot a PBY down with no trouble at all.